Good afternoon, everyone. I open uh, hearing number seven of this period of session of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights which is called Militarization of Public Security in Mexico, which was requested by Seguridad Sin Guerra, the Comisión Mexicana de Defensa y Promoción de Derechos Humanos, México Unido contra la Corrupción, Impunidad Cero, Borde Jurídico, Fundación para la Justicia y el Estado Democrático de Derecho, and others. My name is Julissa Mantilla, President of the Commission. I'm here with Commissioner Rallon, Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena de Tritinio, Rapporteur for Mexico and Children and Adolescents. Also with us today, Executive Secretariat, Assistant Executive Secretariat, Maria Claudia Polido, and Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, Pedro Vaca. First, I, can, I greet the state and the civil society representatives and the uh, representatives of the United Nations. I will explain first the distribution of time. We will have 20 minute participation by the civil society representatives. Then the state will have 20 minutes as well. After that, Mr. Fernandez Maldonado will have seven minutes to intervene. And then we will have a round for the commission for 20 minutes for comments uh, addressed to the civil society representatives and the state representatives. So I will give the floor first to the civil society and I will request them to introduce themselves to open this hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Frida Ibarra, director of Mexico Unido contra la Delincuencia. In Mexico, throughout 15 years, there have been a use of public security forces as uh, documented by the Commission. In this context, there is a legal framework against the American Convention on Human Rights and the Inter-American Court's criteria to give the security forces resources and powers to strengthen civil uh, controls. We will refer to the deepening, to the upsurge of civil society, of uh, public security forces applied all throughout the country, which has had a key role in several aspects of public life. In 2019, the constitution was amended to create the National Guard, and this reform as was uh, temporary and allowed the national forces to uh, function until 2024 as such. This institution has become an additional branch of armed forces and have been carrying out civil um, security, public security. In September this year, the Congress approved the proposal by the president so that the National Guard would be under the uh, administrative con control of Sedena and the reforms are extremely worrying. We will first refer to these five points. The fact that the first uh, chain of command is Sedena, second, the control provided to National Guard is full, and this is only in word. Third, the fact that there is a uh, services of intelligence which allows the police to intervene in investigating crimes, which is extremely worrying since there have been espionage to defenders and journalists recently. Fourth, the uh, agents are under military jurisdiction and also five, there are conditions so that the armed forces continue gathering power resources without the design of robust monitoring. The Congress also approved an initiative that uh, extends these powers until 2028. The Supreme Court of Justice, instead of protecting the constitutional order and human rights prioritizing cases related to militarization, it has been an complex because it has not solved any of the seven cases it is under its jurisdiction. 
also we are seeing the extension of the use of security forces outside of their domains 148 cases are not related to security for example they are building airports and roads this implies an increase of the allocation of resources which is uh, executed in a non transparent way. There have been trans uh, changes of budgetary allocations and no transparency or accountability. The budget executed has increased 163% between 2016 and 2021. Between 20, uh, 2007 and 2021, millions, uh, more than 20 million pesos have been executed for this situations and cases. This allows them to oppose decisions by democratically elect fun, uh, officials. Also, their initiatives drafted in the benefit of agents or military officials. Armed forces in Mexico are becoming politicized and the government protects them from being accountable to citizenship. There is a higher risk that the civil uh, government may not revert this militarization. Madam President, Maria, th this is Maria Luisa Aguilar from the Human Rights Center Juarez. We recognize there is a deep crisis of violence that we must underscore that is related to the crisis in human rights that was seen by the commission in its visit in 2015. The numbers of violence have not increased, but they are uh, at a stalemate around 35,000 femicides per year. There are human rights violations and there is a lack of balance because there are lack of civil control and the civil forces acting in a not transparent way the national commission on human rights since its creation has reported that the national guard has accounted for more than 100 and 1600 complaints against them there were more than 1500 against sedena and more than 300 against semar Despite this high number in 2022, the Commission only uh, issued five recommendations and six of them refer to uh, facts that happened under this, this administration, which accounts for the, for the uh, accomplice role of uh, the National Guard and the government in these cases. The rates of impunity continue to be as alarming as you have uh, reported and documented. From, 20, from 2006 and 2021, only 28 uh, sentences have been issued for crimes related to possession of weapons. The state reported the Committee Against Disappearances that there have always been three sentences for this crime against army officials. This is added to the lack of efficiency of other controls. For example, last week, the Secretary of National Defense refused to participate in a working meeting convened by the Congress, and there was a modification of, uh, of uh, the procedures as well, so that people should not be forced to take the word, to take the floor at these types of uh, meetings. The National Guard referred that information that was requested from them is confidential. Selena said that there are no records on crimes. So in the context of such a long history of cases there has always been there, there has all, only been six public reports one of the service of Sedena has been uh, attacked cyber in a cyber attack and this shows the lack of control on 
security and decision making and the hindering of legal investigations and espionage. Reports made public show the authoritarian view by the army in as regards the work of human rights protection by different um, organizations such as feminist organizations that are considered threats. This is added to documents on, peg on the use of Pegasus by Sedena against two journalists and one human rights defendants. In this context, the resistance of accountability on the part of armed forces is an evidence of the lack of robust control and deepens the risk of uh, the threats reported by the commission in the face of such uh, empowering they are receiving. Thank you very much. Civil society still has the floor. Madam President, thank you. While the state has implemented a security uh, strategy that supposes a single type of threat or violence in the country, the reality is that there, there are several types of violence. However, the government has not characterized this violence as has deployed the armed forms forces without any evidence-based strategy and without any monitoring. Article 89 of the Constitution endows the president the power of uh, having the availability of the armed forces in the face of a foreign uh, threat, also of the use of such a militarized power. But the restriction of rights is one of the most paradoxical and controversial facts here. The idea is that there should be special mechanism to address crisis. This has to do with extraordinary powers, except exercise in uh, exceptional situation. What's true here is that this action must be supervised by the Supreme Court of Justice and the Congress, which should hinder the use of armed forces, which are not related to citizen security. This leads us to understand that ever since these armed forces have been deployed in, Mexi in Mexico, there the army has contravened or infringed uh, constitutional articles and also article number 27 of the American Convention through these actions that are not monitored and have defrauded the convention and the constitution. They have detained civilians arbitrarily and have transferred them to uh, different army environments have tortured them and denied their rights of uh, due defense. They also infringed Article 27.1 of the American Convention by executing actions that are not compatible with international law. This has meant that this recent reform that intends to extend the deadline is not complying with the prerequisite of exceptionality or state of siege. Since violence is not characterized, there is a no justification to have uh, army forces uh, act on national territory nor of the extension of this deadline. Good morning. The effects of the militarization of public security, as has been mentioned, has been multiple. The focus will be the specific effects on women. Several investigations have shown that there usually are uh, upsurges of violence, and this impacts women especially. For example, according to the last survey on the dynamics of relationships in homes of 2021, only in the previous year, 
8,000 women suffered physical, sexual, and emotional violence on the part of uh, Marines or army officials. Also, women have been arbitrarily detained and suffered sexual abuse on the part of armed forces. For example, according to the latest national survey on persons deprived of their liberty in 2021 out of the women that were detained by police officers, 5% suffered a violation. Out of those detained by the army, the uh, numbers go to 10%. And out of those detained by the Marines, this number rises to 20%. So from 5 to 10 to 20%. Those are the risks implied by armed army forces. This Regardless of this direct violence, there's also additional violence by the strategy. For example, confrontations involving army forces are associated to an increase of all types of rates of murders of men and women. The fact that today 10 women are murdered on average per day in Mexico cannot be understood without considering this militarization strategy. This has led to an increase of murder, murders of women, but also a transformation of these types of crimes. Three out of 10 women died with um, firearms in, in the year 2000. Right now, this number has doubled. And this has to do with homes as well, not only on with crimes on the streets. Mexican women face the war of machism and also the war against crime. The, the lives of women are changed when they are direct victims of militarization, also when they are family members of those who suffer this type of situation. For example, many uh, processes to seek justice are have women at the center of those processes. Finally, it's important to say that the impact of militarization among women, as it happens with men, uh, are not compatible to what happens with uh, men. Several uh, communities, indigenous communities, have been attacked by military officers and women have suffered the differentiated impact. Also migrant women have been at the center of this conflict. So for this reasons, militarization must be addressed from an intersectional approach to see how this impacts and how this will continue impacting the society. Hello. I am here on behalf of Seguridad uh, Sin Guerra. The demilitarization of security forces must be understood from a peace approach, which have to do with dismantling these uh, networks of macro criminality uh, made up of financial branches as well. The great problem that we face here is the problem of fragmentation. We have uh, around 10 cartels um groups that are operating around the, the country but we have to work very locally for example we could establish uh some um lights for example to apply red to those who are most the most dangerous and green uh to areas that are not dangerous for example we could start working with the 50 most violent uh, municipality that concentrate 45 percent of crimes and as we identify those municipalities it's important to recover our young poor youth that have been captured by these networks and to do that we need to have social assimilation and demil demilitarization with this we also need to reconstruct the police forces that have been captured by this uh, criminality groups. We also need to reconstruct the system of uh, public prosecutor's offices because there are uh, great problems of impunity and administration of justice. We also need um, to dismantle these networks to reconstruct police uh, groups and we can progressively um, remove military officers from these municipalities. And finally, which is very important, we have thousands of 
victims of serious human rights violations. And for those victims, we require ordinary and extraordinary uh, bodies to administer justice. Finally, to conclude our participation in this hearing, we want to request specific things from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Four requests. First, it has to do with request and information from the state on the regulatory framework that have to do with intelligence of military officers and armed forces that are foreseen to protect human rights and also to build a national guard following all principles of citizen security, also requesting information on the application uh, implementation and assessment of uh, development plans of police uh, groups to also monitor the extraordinary use of armed forces in public security tasks and also information on the use of Pegasus against defenders and journalists and the contracts of the National Defense Secretariat for this, uh, the use of this software. The second request is in the face of a non-existence of a de facto uh, state of siege, that it recognizes the situation according to, to Article 27 and 28 of the Constitution. The third request is to implement a comprehensive plan of long-standing peace to assimilate poor and, and vulnerable youth into society. Finally, we want to present uh, to request once again to bring to the Inter-American Court an advisory opinion on the scope of the participation of armed forces in public security tasks in the countries of the regions. That would be all. Thank you very much. Ambassador, you're muted. Thank you. Good afternoon, distinguished commissioners, Madam President, Madam Rapporteur for Mexico, representatives of the civil society, ladies and gentlemen, following this hearing remotely. As Mexico's representative, I was requested to bring a message from the President of the Republic. Mexico is currently undergoing a big transformation. This transformation includes addressing the major national problems as well as the citizens' demands. One of the most relevant of them is public security. The um, orders to the um, Ministry for Security is uh, to are to follow the national strategy that was passed by the Senate in 2019. And this allows for the coordination of efforts and specific actions and the organization of resources and the operational execution with a clear objective to bring peace to our justice, to our country. The um, Cabinet of Security, which is headed by the president, meets every day at 6 a.m. and makes decisions on how to address the situation. For example, the operation of uh, the local tables for peace building, where the authorities of all the levels of government coordinate to face crime. Also, the operation of the National Guard across Mexico, which currently has 118,000 assets that work swiftly to protect the population, and the um, preparation of work tables to work on priority issues, such as the theft of hydrocarbons or uh, illicit logging or um, using illicit resources, chemical substances, and the issue of migration. 
also stricter controls on the um, armed of the armed forces on our borders against uh, drug and human trafficking. Also, support is granted to the states that uh, are in a more serious situation in terms of security. Currently, we have a legal framework that was passed by the Congress that orders the armed forces to act in accordance to the law. There's no impunity for those who violate the rights of uh, women or, the, or for those who act against their integrity. Violence against women is not normal. It's a crime and it must be punished. Protocols are fostered to improve the um, performance of police as first respondents at these cases. Activities are organized to prevent violence against students, teachers, and parents at public schools, sports events, at, and, conf and conflicts against the law. With the national strategy for public security, we have engaged or compromised the criminal structures across the nation in an unprecedented effort in this administration. 65,000 members of criminal gangs were arrested, including 143 from um, criminal organizations and many of them were priority uh, targets for us. As the Mexican government said to the UN, our country went into this uh, violence spiral due to the um, drug uh, epidemic that we're seeing in the world. Controls were improved in all the entrances to our country to detect um, chemicals or um, money, illegal money or, uh, armed or arms. And we have worked in order to dismantle the structures that traffic human beings. Also, uh, there is a monitoring, if there are monitoring efforts on companies that import chemicals so as to control or to oversee their um, possibilities of working for with a, illegal drugs. Also, the government is working against the um, transnational organized crime. So far, we have seen the following results that were already presented at the Congress. The insurance that 32,000 weapons and 17 million uh, um, sets of ammunition and over 200 grenades. The um, criminal organizations were affected by over 40 thousand billion pesos, 94,000 kilos of cocaine were seized, 194% more than in the previous administration. And this affected 10,000 billion pesos of the organized crime gangs. 194 tons of meth was, methamphetamines were seized also an increase from the previous administration. And this affected uh, these organizations in over 44,000 billion pesos, thousands of hectares that had been um, used to produce uh, poppy seeds were um, seized as well. The same occurred with lands that were used to farm marijuana, over 1,000 opium 
uh, tons of opium were seized as well. And 429 kilos of heroin, which hit the organizations in 1,000 million, uh, 1 billion dollars, sorry, 1 billion pesos. All of this affected the finances of these criminal groups, of course. And the result of this is a um, drop in the power of these criminal organizations compared to the results of um, December 2018. The drop is of about 23.3%. Now, with regards to um, the uh, regular spheres, we see improvements as well. When we compare 2022 to 2018, there was a drop in 54% 54, 54 of kidnaps. Over 2,000 victims were freed. 5,000 kidnappers were arrested and 518 kidnapping bands were uh, disarticulated, representatives of the civil society and commissioners. The Mexican army is not an army that is from other administrations. And its work does not have an impact on the entire institution or their members. The army is a comprehensive part in the transformation of our country. It works for the people, as the people. That is why we say that it is the people in uniform. Finally, I would like to bring to you a message from our president. In today's Mexico, unlike what we saw in the neoliberal governments, where you kept complicit silence, no human rights are violated, and no military corporation uh, violates human rights. We Finally, um, we would like to ask you to stop acting as um, allies of the conservative groups in Mexico and around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. If that is all for the state, I will give the floor to Mr. Guillermo Fernandez Maldonado for seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to greet the authorities of the Commission of the State and the representatives from the civil society. I am here at this public hearing of the 185th period of sessions called Militarization of Public Security in Mexico. I'm doing this as a representative of the Office of the High Commissioner of, the hum of Human Rights from the UN at Mexico. I'm here to present informal information. I am not under oath, and I will present information about the militarization of public security in Mexico. None, nothing in my comments should be understood as a resignation to the um, faculties given to me. But I appreciate the fact that we're all here to discuss um, the concerns on the growing militarization of uh, public security in a context where civil controls need to be strengthened. Mexico is facing terrible challenges in terms of uh, criminality and violence, especially if we consider the links between some organized crime um, authority um, structures and authorities. The uh, growing militarization has not been able to bring down violence. It has actually led to serious violations of human rights by the armed forces and other security bodies. Most of these are have, have still not been punished. And this militarization, which was strengthened in the past years, has has uh, shown us the need to implement uh, judicial reform. 
and because this trend must be reversed because the members of the army that uh, violate human rights need to be held accountable just as the um, the, the fact that um public authorities who ordered them to do that should be brought to justice as well. Military presence is regulated in a very restrictive manner by international standards. As the High Commissioner has mentioned in the past few years, more recently um, at the time of the um, constitutional reform, the deployment of military forces must be a last resource that must be controlled by independent uh, civil society organizations because their performance, their acting undermines uh, the rule of law. And that has been the, the norm for the at least 24 years in the uh, human rights community. That is why we, the government is urged to bring back the armed forces to their usual tasks. It is important to remember that states must foster policies focused on protecting human beings, not the security of the state or a political project. We should also say that the militarized paradigm of the government affects women in particular, in particular women and adolescents and migrants who are part of, of who are part of minorities. This also affects the work of journalists and human rights defenders. Now, with regards to the law that was mentioned, we believe that this reform goes against the uh, actual national constitution, which says that the national guard must be guard must be civilian and it must be part of a secretariat. And it also says that in times of peace, the military authorities should only be referred to their usual activities. That is why we believe that um the um reports against this um law or this bill are le totally legitimate it is very important for the civil society to be able to control these uh, these military authorities so it's very concerning to see that the civil society should um give its jurisdiction to the military when we're talking about public security it is very concerning that this reform could undermine the constitutional process held in 2019. If the, all the public security focuses, uh, sorry, uh, the tasks were focused on the military, that would go against the constitution as well, because it, it undermines institutionality. And all of this lacks a human rights resource, uh, approach, but it also goes to show that the military and the police are not exchangeable because of, they have different training backgrounds. The police focuses on the threats against uh, the public security and a proportional use of the force, completely different from the army, which acts in times of war. The legal framework of the police is compatible with human rights in terms of accountability and transparency. Still, many of these rights are usually uh, restrained under uh, military uh, operations because they say that they are, uh, this is done because of security reasons. But their work or their operation must always be overseen by the civil authorities. The current situation calls for reflection and analysis based on evidence that seeks ways to adapt the armed forces to the international standards. Finally, um, I would like to um, remind Mexico that it needs to um, limit military participation in civilian jurisdiction 
and should answer to civilian law and should be able to face the um, security challenges respecting human rights with accountability. That is the best way to meet international obligations in terms of human rights when it comes to protecting uh, and protecting the rights of everyone in the population of Mexico. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to ask uh, Mr. Rallon if he has any questions. Thank you very much, Madam President. You are very kind. I had a question in particular about the role of the Secretariat for Security and Citizens Protection in the um, operations of the citizens' security in Mexico. What's the role of that Secretariat? after all this in terms of operations. And my other question is about the uh, practical implications in this modification with, uh, with regards to the duties of the National Guard. Thank you, Commissioner. Country Rapporteur, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Rosamena. Thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank all the um, attendees, all the civil society organizations for their being here today. I would also like to thank the representative of the High Commissioner. And of course, I would also like to thank Ambassador Roselena for this opportunity to um, hear the message conveyed by her, the message from the president of the Mexican Republic. First of all, I would like to say that for the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, the issue of security and peace and the need to strengthen or recover Mexico's trust in its civil society is vital. And this has been assessed by the commission. It was assessed in its report in 2015 and it had recommendations about the steps to demilitarize uh, citizens' security in Mexico. It is true that public security is at stake here, and national security as well, but We've seen and or over and over again that the participation of the army in these areas has never been fruitful. Not as the governments expect and have always expected. The representatives of the state, the representative of the state, sorry, mentioned the achievements of the administration in terms of this type of violence. And one of the speakers was talking about having a wider vision of what Mexico might be facing in terms of violence, the different types of violence that will call for different types of answers. What I find most concerning, uh, actually I agree with the questions of Commissioner Rolón, but I would like to specifically ask about the meaning of uh, these um, 
comparison between what's going on and the constitutional framework, because I think this is key in the call to the state to address what its own legal order establishes to prevent impunity from occurring, to prevent most the most vulnerable groups from being affected. As was mentioned here, the issue of accountability, the institution, sorry, uh, uh, the issue of accountability in these armed forces, because this seems to go against the political, the legal um, order and the American convention. So how can Mexico How can Mexico, in when developing its programs and policies, how can they do that when they are working against their own institutional or constitutional uh, regulations? That is the position of my rapporteurship. We would like to urge the Mexican state to think of how it will address public safety and security in all of its dimensions, not only um, narco criminality. How will they address that? The intention of the commission is to seek ways to establish these mechanisms to communicate with the state so as to answer the calls of the civil society. Since we believe these are very, these are very important issues that should be addressed, so that's what I wanted to say, Madam President. Very well, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Bernal, go ahead. Thank you, Madam President. First of all, I wanted to thank the petitioners, the members of the civil society for bringing to this table of discussion this aspect for their uh, for being so courageous despite being so young. I'm, I'm seeing so many uh, young faces, but they are here uh, defending human rights of their country and also want to greet the representative of the state for being here to try to build some bridges of dialogue. So in that sense, I usually think these hearings are deliberative, uh, are, are hearings to construct dialogue between the society and the states. And for that reason, I've, I, I am a bit disappointed by the state's response because the state is not responding the specific items submitted by the civil society. Since there is a second, um, moment for an intervention for the ambassador, I would like to request from the ambassador to respond to the specific points presented by the civil society. And then as regards the representative of the United uh, Nations, I would like them to, to respond this as regards Mexico. First, what's the problem with uh, the violation of the standards in relation with militarization, which is uh, which is very important. Then second, the topic of the lack of proportions in military officers' actions, which is a recurrent uh, theme brought by the petitioners. Third, something very well stated by Commissioner Arosemena, which is the lack of constitutionality of many of these measures. 
four points, which was presented by the petitioners in a very clear way, which is the existence of a de facto state of siege, which since it's not declared, there are no constitutional controls and inter-American controls that are appropriate for these types of uh, situations. So if you're going to build a dialogue here, we should start by really providing a very specific and concrete answer on those points. And that is what I expect from the state representative. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I'll use uh, the. Fl I'll take the floor now. I was uh, hearing very attentively the intervention of both parties, and also the Commission has been monitoring this topic for quite some time. So I have a very concrete question to the state first. Beyond seeing these measures against the implementation of these measures, have had an effect positive. That really implementar estas medidas de uso de la fuerza, por ejemplo, de las fuerzas armadas han tenido un impacto positivo en el control en la seguridad eh, y si ha sido así cómo lo están midiendo, o sea, cuáles son las pruebas y, y, y siguiendo este este argumento, digamos, desde un poco eh, forzando un poco el argumento para tener la claridad, o sea, porque si esta política ha sido positiva quiere decir que se va a eternizar, porque si con las fuerzas armadas así controlando la seguridad las cosas están bien, es pues mejor que sigan ahí para siempre. ¿No? Entonces, y eso sí nos llevaría, pues, eh, pues ya nos estaría llevando a una situación bastante problemática. Entonces la primera pregunta es esa. O sea, ¿realmente había una evaluación del antes y del después de estas medidas? ¿Ya había una disminución de la criminalidad? ¿Se ha mantenido el respeto al debido proceso? Etcétera, etcétera. Eh, porque creo que sería muy complicado eh, si, si, si la respuesta es que no, pues entonces ya hay que sacarlas de una vez. Hay que eh, eh, modificarlas. Y si la respuesta es que sí, entonces vamos a tener un estado militar constantemente. Por eso sí quisiera eh, primero saber qué evaluación se, se ha hecho hasta el momento. Más allá de que ya aquí puedo record, eh, recordar muchos casos, muchos estándares, el caso Zambrano contra Ecuador, que es como el caso líder en cuanto el uso excepcional de las fuerzas armadas. Etc., as was mentioned by the commissioners. So, Estefania had said, uh, particularly the impact of militarization on women. So, in that sense, I would like to uh, ask the civil society and the state if they have detailed information on cases of sexual violation against civil society members, if there have been any pregnancies as uh, the consequence of these types of abuses, and if there have been sanction, sanctions against military officers that have perpetrated these acts. And second, I'm seeing these cases, Valentina, Inés Fernandez, um, Cotton Field, but I know very clearly that they Inter-American court establishes that the use of sexual violence was a tool in this case for repetition. So I want to ask of both parties, especially the state, if there are any information points on this. What's the training given to armed forces taking into account the uh, the background and what are the sanctions? What processes have been opened if this is verified? Y algo más muy importante también dijo Estefanía, el and tema something de... else that was very important, as mentioned by Estefanía, is the militarization of borders, because if that militarization affects migrant women, and in that case, women migrants, what are the specific measures being taken? So that would be all on my part. I give the floor to um, Assistant uh, Executive Secretariat, Maria Claudia Polido. First of all, I would like to greet everyone who is here. Thank you, Madam President. And also to pick up on what Madam President said, I wanted to say that one of the recommendations of the country report that Maria Luisa Aguilar referred to is related to the strengthening of police corps, police officers. So the question on my part would be, what are the measures that have been adopted to strengthen the police forces which have the power to prevent and assist in crimes from a civil perspective? So both at a municipality 
at state and federal levels. I would like to know that point of information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Special Rapporteur Pedro Baca, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I greet all the members of the commission and the secretariat, the civil society representatives, and very especially the delegation of the state. Madam Ambassador, I would like to start by quoting the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which I believe is very uh, adequate for this case. The court has stated that in a democratic society, not only is it legal or uh, legitimate, but actually it's a, it's a duty on authorities to pronounce themselves on interests that are public. However, they are subjected to certain limitations as of the duty to reasonable evidence the facts that argue that they argue. Also, they should do this with due diligence even more swiftly than in other cases. And the court says that this is done in view of their scope and the potential effects that their expressions may have in certain parts of the society and in order to avoid that the citizenship and other uh, stakeholders receive a manipulated version of reality. Also, I expected from this hearing that we would deal with many issues that are very much at the forefront of the public debate. We are speaking about a policy of security, so I agree in many of the things that have been presented by the state as regards that transformative horizon, they state, but also as regards the, the issues related to Pegasus or the alleged use of Pegasus on uh, with relation to uh, journalists and human rights defenders. I want to speak of the profiling of different persons in files of uh, security bodies such as threat or dangerous or other types of labels. These labels are comparable to organized crime members, but they are also being used against feminist organizations as well. So first, one question. Is this happening according to the state? That would be one first question. And whether there should be any messages if this is not happening, it conveys that journalists and civil society members know that the state is not labeling them with these concepts. These labels could shape the perception of those who have access to that information by and, and I think this is especially sensitive and it also may shape the actions of security organizations in the face of people that are considered a, a threat or dangerous. Second point, we spoke out about transparency and access to information and I received some information here as a special rapporteur and uh, which has been addressed here at this hearing and it could be summarized as a dilemma as regards the correspondence between these, the information requested by civil society before and what has been become known with this Wakamaya leaks situation. So I would like to request the state to state if beyond this lack of correspondence between the information that we have right now and the, and the information that we had before, what would be the next step in as regards the principle of uh, reliability of information, which is the basis of this sort of uh, situations. Then, as regards surveillance, you spoke about the alleged use of Pegasus, which was targeted at two journalists and one human rights defender. So I would like to know very briefly if among the powers of uh, intelligence um, of uh, officials, they have the power to intervene in private uh, conversations. And also, finally, I would like to know of uh, this thing about conservatism. I don't know if they meant this for um, uh, 
for the commission or for the civil society representatives. But I would like to know that I don't think this is targeted at me because that label really uh, simplifies such complex conversations as, as this one. So I would uh, request from the state that they do not use this sort of labels against any of, of us here present because they, this does not contribute to a positive uh, result. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Rapporteur. The civil society has the floor for another 10 minutes. Thank you, Daniel Vázquez here. Well, the report on security policies presented by the ambassador was very interesting, but however, the hearing is not on on this topic, but actually of the on militarization of public security. I would like her to explain why there are 150,000 military officers and Marines all throughout the country doing different uh, actions. What are the effective controls used to uh, create monitoring, especially when the secretaries of the defense and secretariat do not really uh, are, hold, are held accountable? Also, I would like to have an explanation as of why they uh, did a legislative amendment to take the National Guard to this level of authority when we would actually be needing to think uh, on quite the contrary terms. Why was this extension until 2028, but then how are they going to remove those 100 and 50,000 officers, even in 2028, because in consequence, not only this program to build a peace, but among that program, the program of progressive removal or withdrawal, how would that be implemented? I, instead of evasion, we would need to focus on debating on the problem of militarization of a country such as Mexico. Thank you. Well, I wanted to pick up on how unfortunate it, it is that a, only one person, a uh, representative of the state, is here at this hearing. It's also very unfortunate to see uh, figures of uh, seizures of drugs as an accomplishment on the part of the state it's in a context in which of uh, precisely the strategy in drug trafficking, in the war against drug trafficking, has criminalized the, the victims and violate multiple human rights. We believe that the state should not justify disappearances, murders, and tortures, uh, taking pride in such accomplishments, such as seizures of drugs or a detaining some uh, organized crime leaders which who have le who have left a country as a common cemetery full of victims as regards uh, commissioner Arosemena's question in relation with such an open uh, mo modification of the constitution we believe this has to do with a weakening of democracy of uh, disdain in the face of the law or or as we can see this this relation with civil society organizations it's very sad to see in such exercise uh, exercises as this one we continue seeing a stigmatization of human rights defenders as uh, and labeled as um as conservatives, as uh, Rapporteur Baca said, and it's very important to, to highlight this, this labeling of uh, people in Mexico. That would be all on my part. It's also important to see this idea related to rotten apples, this idea of having a couple of uh, people violating uh, human rights and that and that that does not constitute a threat or a possibility of the whole army being corrupt. But we want to underscore as well that a survey in 2021 
uh, indicates that out of the persons that were detained by armed forces, nine out of 10 of those suffered an attack during detention, nine out of 10. Those data indicate that the problem doesn't have to do with isolated persons that are part of the armed forces, but actually with the armed forces as an institution. As we said, the problem is with the vision and institutional purpose of the armed forces. They were constituted for war. And precisely for that reason, there are a set of rules, including military protection. Lastly, I would like to say that we, we try to come here with examples of things that are very much concerning, but we are seeing that the armed forces continue requesting for powers, but they do not necessarily want to be held accountable. For example, in 2019, there was a national law on the use of forces enacted, and this law forces the armed forces to, to, to pr provide reports. And the response was, well, we're not obliged to submit reports. Lastly, in order to answer the question as regards impunity and sexual violence, I want to say once again that between 2006 and 2021, there were only 28 sentences against army officials. This includes everything, including sexual violence. So we're providing this data to repeat that impunity is a rule, not the exception. And and as regards to Wakamaya leaks, we see that impunity is not only against civilian women, but actually against the women that are soldiers and part of the armed forces. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like I would like to answer some of the questions, but of course we will send you more information, more updated information, if we may, about these questions. Now, with regards to the question of Commissioner Rosemena, with regards to the um, role of the Secretariat for Citizen Security, the truth is that it's only a role of uh, name only right now. It still has some specific tasks on the formulation of security strategies, but working with the national defense, they also design some training programs. But the truth is that after this latest reform, it's focused, the idea is for the operational part and that the administrative part, meaning the entire budget area, this is all part of the armed forces now. Also, I think it's very important to answer some of the questions with regards to the controls and transparency. That's one of the major issues, as Estefania was saying. It is regrettable that the state has not even referred to those controls that has been trying to promote. And as we mentioned in our participations, the external controls on the security forces, in particular to the National Guard, they are now more symbolic than anything. And I say this in response to the questions of the president and the assistant secretary with regards to the programs that have been implemented to strengthen the uh, state police institutions, but also the follow-up on the recommendations and the um, verdict that, lead, that led to the creation of an observatory. As you may remember that it ordered the state to create an independent observatory and the truth is that since the police doesn't exist, it would be actually from the um, independent from the National Guard, but the state has told the commission it has no intention to follow up this recommendation. It has said so several times to us as well, and it's very concerning if we consider this particular context. Finally, 
I would like to mention something that Mr. Vaca was saying. In this group of uh, civil society um, associations, uh, we are not conservative. We have been working for th over 30 years on the promotion of the defense of human rights. All of my colleagues from other groups have been working on these issues as well. They have been working on documenting serious human rights violations by the military. This is very important for us. This is in no way something about politics or parties. It's about working uh, for something we believe in because we have seen its real impact on communities, on individuals and how the deployment of military forces affects all that. That is why we're here asking the commission to support us in these requests we have made, in particular with regards to um, asking the state for information and asking uh, the Inter-American Court for an advisory opinion. Thank you. Now I will give the floor to um, the ambassador. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. We take note of all the uh, comments. Everything was said will be sent to the uh, Office of the President. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. So we are almost at the end of our hearing. And since we have a little bit more time, I would like to make a couple of reflections. First of all, I would like to thank the civil society, not only for their being here today, but because of their constant work. Because each of the cases you work on are cases about people, beyond the figures, right, and the statistics. We're talking about people who are going through a very complex situation in terms of human rights. I would also like to thank the ambassador, the commission appreciates your being here, Madam Ambassador, as uh, Commissioner Bernal was saying, we are trying to work for dialogue. Today, we were talking to journalists and they told us that the, uh, the language might seem confrontational, but we believe that it is better than not having anything. Of course, there's much concern around this issue and the commission through its rapporteur, uh, through its rapporteur, uh, Mr. Baca, for example, um, pays attention to what the civil society has to say, but it also seeks to assist the state in complying with its obligations to protect and to prevent. Commissioner Bernal, thank you, Commissioner, made a very uh, accurate summary of the items that could be discussed, and since we were unable to cover all that today. I would like to ask the state to send us uh, this information in written form. And we will keep on working as we have um, with our mechanisms and our rapporteurships that have been working on monitoring the situation of the press and access to information by the media. The commission would like to thank you once again. We know that this hearing is being watched by a lot of people. And I would like to tell all of those who are unable to file reports, who are going through a difficult situation with their human rights. Um, we are the hope of these persons. And the commission will follow closely this case promoting international standards, and most especially looking to work with uh, in a dialogue that has nothing to do with politics, because our standard are human rights. And beyond political ideologies, these obligations seek to respect uh, human beings' inherent rights. So thank you so much for all this information. Let's keep on working. It's not an easy dialogue, but as I always said, it's better than nothing. We will always prefer to have this. The commission is at your disposal. Thank you so much. I would also like to thank the interpreters and the team of the International of the Inter-American Com Commission. I will now like to close this hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Gracias. Muchas gracias, un saludo.